preacher. It's not what I started. I wanted to be a doctor, not a PhD. I wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. I love science. I love biology. But my pastor, Jay Miller, saw something in me, gave me a microphone, and dude, I sucked mm -hmm. that first one. But it gave me a glimpse, man, when people mm -hmm. said, dude, that was pretty good, dude, for, yeah. for a sermon. So for people, that's my challenge to them. When I say play the movie is play the movie. 
be the star in your own life. And if you're not liking how the movie is, is, is trajecting toward an end, you can change it. You can change it. And sometimes you can't do it alone. You have to call on people and say, hey man, I'm struggling with something right now. Good morning. Let's try it again. Good morning. Wow, you guys are amazing. Uh, it's my joy to stand before him. Larry Bauckham, the lead pastor of Suncoast. Also, I uh, want to remind you a couple of things happening in the life of the church. One is that if you uh, want to take communion at the end of the service, once a month, first weekend of the month, we offer communion down front on this side. Secondly, if you would like to donate blood, we have the vampire mobile in the, in the parking lot. So if you'd like to do that, we have them and occasionally, so we appreciate you taking time for that as well. A lot of good things are happening. This is a season. It's May, and in May, it seems like uh, the temperature's still a little cool this morning. It won't stay here long, and some of our winter residents have made their way back up north, and I, I miss them. You know, I want you to know I, if they're here, I tell them I miss them. If they're gone, I tell them I miss them, but... But it is a little less traffic on the road, fair enough. So we miss that too. But uh, we're, we're teaching today from uh, this, this uh, idea of practical prescriptions. And I start by talking about when I was a kid. We'd have birthday parties in my house. And, and typical, some of you remember this, the birthdays, you have know, presents or whatever. And then there was a time in this, where I grew up with the birthday spanking. It was never meant to be abusive, just a little taps. You know, eight years old, you get eight little swats on your on your behind unless your brother's there and he's the younger brother he's always trying to get one swat and it's way too hard but you know but you go into seven eight and nine and then you're eight years old boom and then we say one more and one to grow on exactly and as we're teaching practical prescriptions every week I think there's something we're trying to teach us it's really one to grow on and today I'd like to give you some more insights into that our lives should be that of growth Today we're looking at the fourth of nine lessons for becoming more. These lessons are for those who want personal growth. They're for those who want more. The lessons are for those who realize that something is missing. So nine practical prescriptions. You have them in your notes today. You can take it home with you in a few minutes. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on a mirror somewhere where you can see it. Put it in your car. Just put it somewhere where we can occasionally just glance through these and kind of repeat them as you do. So the first week the prescription was dig it up. The story in the New Testament is about them hiding their talents. One had five and they invested them. One had two and invested them. But the one who had one, he hid his talent in the ground and he buried it and didn't use it. And dig it up is to those who simply say, you know, I've been gifted in so many areas, but I don't want to, I've kind of moved away from that. I'm very social with people, but I don't want to do that. I'm very good at education, but I don't want to do that. So you move away from that which you've been gifted. Do you know that people who have perfect pitch, if they don't maintain that that studies in music, they sort of lose that perfect pitch. It's not something you keep forever. So when you work in it and stay in it, uh, you know, dig up those good things, those talents, those abilities. Don't let them be lost. So dig it up, give it to God, let it live. That was week one. The second week was really a little more uh, about pulling teeth. And it's called pull the tooth. Pull the tooth really means pull the toxic tooth. If you have a toothache, back in the day, they'd say, oh, my tooth is hurt, my jaw is all sweat up. The best thing we can do is pull the tooth. So they pull the tooth. But today with our dentistry, you know, so, oh, well, you know, let's protect the teeth. Let's do whatever we can. But, but when a child at about five or six years old, they come to you and say, I got a woose tooth. You know that? And they wiggle it back and forth. And sometimes they're really wiggling it back and forth. And, and my grandkids to this day will come to me and say, Pop, feel my tooth. And I go, do you want me to pull it out? Most of the time they'll say yes. But by that time, usually it's just a matter of gripping it with your fingers. and just it does not much pulling to it. But when Laura, the one who was singing today, that's my oldest child, when she was about five years old, she came to me, lived in Fort Myers, and she said, Dad, I, want you, I got a loose tooth. Will you pull my tooth? So I thought, well, just go out, Laura, look at my toolbox, and bring back a pair of pliers. <laughs> and she brought back a pair of channel locks this big. I just remember walking up and said, here it is. Ready? I thought, how trusting. How foolish. And I didn't need the pliers. You know, just a little wiggle, and the tooth comes out. But pulling the tooth... Sometimes because there's something that needs to grow in and you're just keeping on to something that needs to change. 
So sometimes you pull the tooth because of that. And sometimes it's the impacted wisdom tooth that needs to come out through surgery. But why do we do that? Because it's long-term negative drain. Why do you let toxic things continue in your life? Really the point is let's cleanse ourselves of a lot of toxic behavior. Last week, and, and Pastor Troy did an excellent job with pull the tooth and also play the movie. And play the movie is when we, we begin to realize my life is, you know, it's going along every day, but I begin to forecast where I'm headed. And when the trajectory of your life is not where you're wanting it to go, don't go there. Change the movie. That's the point. So I remember talking to a couple, a few years ago, I, I taught the same thing maybe eight years ago or 10 years ago. And I, I talked about, you know, hey, if you don't like the trajectory of your life, then change it. And they came to me after the service uh, about a week later. They said, we won't let you know. We listened to what you said last week and we're moving to North Carolina. <laughs> I said, well, that's a smart church growth sermon. I mean, you're running people away. They said, well, we want to have kids and she's pregnant and both our parents live in North Carolina. And we thought we want our kids who grow up around their cousins and their grandparents really need help. And we don't like the trajectory. So why wait a few years? Let's do it now. So they, they really, you know, some measure, they pull the tooth, they play the movie and they begin to make some changes in their life. So I think that's important. Today, we're looking at practical prescription number four. And this is do something. It's not about being passive or waiting. It's about being proactive and doing something. And we're going to look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. Listen to what he says. Oops, sorry. I don't have it on the screen. I'm going to read it to you. Philippians chapter 2. I like to paraphrase it. Therefore, dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but also when I'm not here, continue to work out your God connection with me with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in us, you know, to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Think about that. Let me say that one more time. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God without a lot of issues in a crooked and depraved generation. If you do so, you'll shine in the darkness where others do not. So what is Paul trying to say? Several things. Number one, it's in your notes. Fill in the blank if you want. Here's the first part. We need to do something about growth. He says, just like you've always obeyed when I'm here and even when I'm gone, continue. Continue to work out, he says, your salvation. What he really means is continue to work out your God connection. Continue to work out all those things that are, that are being oppressive in your life. Work it out. Paul says, keep up the good work, but don't stop. Keep growing because it's God within trying to balance things out. I grew up in an environment where I thought God was always out here. And I'm here always inviting God to come and do whatever. Get me out of trouble. Forgive me. Help me. God who lives in the clouds. And then one day, and I think Paul is saying this very clearly, it is God who works in you to act according to his good purpose. I think when the day I realized that God is in me, he's always been in me, he's always been a part of my life, it changed the way I view God and the way I view myself. It changed the way I view the world. The world. Paul's saying, keep up the good work. Keep growing because God is within. He's trying to balance things out. B continue to be obedient. Don't quit. Continue, don't stop. Which leads me to this thought. You know, some people are great starters, but they're not great finishers. Do you know those people? They jump in halfway and they get in and they feel pretty good. And then they're, I'm out. This is all I can commit to. I don't want to do this anymore. I, I thought it would be fun, but it's not, so I'm done. And there are other people that they'll be a little more hesitant to start because they're counting all the costs because they want to finish, and they're finishers. And they, they calculate. Sometimes they wait and wait and wait, and then when they finally get in, they will stay, the, of course, because they've counted all the costs. And then there's a third group, not the smart group, probably a little dimly lit, these are the people that jump in and they, and they finish anyway. They don't count the cost, but they're so finishers, they just keep going and think, I should have thought this through. I didn't think this through. Pastor, how do you know about that group? That's me. I'm a guy that sometimes I will jump and then, you know, ready, shoot, aim. You jump in and you realize, hey, I can't swim. But you learn to swim quick or you're in trouble. And I'm not the only one in that category. 
I see you and I know you and I know who you are. But, but there are those of us, even though we do that, we refuse to quit and we will stay the course and finish. Paul is speaking to a community and their actions to one another. What he's really saying, continue to live for God. Don't stop. Work it out. You can figure it out. When Becky and I were married uh, 47 years ago, we, uh, we come from two different worlds. I grew up, I had nine kids and a mom and dad that both worked at night. And we, you know, at one time, one was married by the time the other one, the last one was born, but in a two bedroom house, two bedroom and an outhouse. We had eight kids live there. Does, I mean, that sounds rough. I talked to my mother. She said she felt pretty uptown because she lived in Nashville when she was a girl and she swept the floor as a dirt floor. So no matter how, many small, how small a house it was, we just all stacked in there. We didn't know any better. We thought life was great. I look back and go, it wasn't that good. But I go, but it really was. My wife, on the other hand, she grew up with a family that was a little more guarded, made a little better income. Her dad and her mom owned a beach resort on Longboat Key. You see the difference? If you don't see the difference, it's pretty obvious. But I will say this about her parents. They didn't, it wasn't just a silver spoon. Do you know what you call the daughter of a beach resort owner on Longboat Key in the mid-1960s? Made. She and her mother both made beds. Even though they were there, they still had to work at it. They were a family that worked together, middle-class America, and they really worked to try to make things happen, and they did. But we got married, though. We brought in all these different values, all the different things. Do you know, I always think my mother did all these things, so my wife should do all those. She thought her dad did all these things, so I should do all those. Wrong. It just didn't work that way. There's a marriage counseling going on. And one of the things that really happened is when we got married in 1976, the bicentennial year, we both lived on Longboat Key for six months. I don't know if I ever told you that. Six months, we lived... I worked as a, in a cabinet shop on Cattleman Road, and she worked as a maid and switchboard operator for the hotel, on the motel they were in, a beach resort. And we grew up in this environment. We lived there six months. But the best thing that happened is when we moved away from there, we moved to Nashville. You know why? Because I was away from my family. She was away from her family. And we had to figure it out together. Right? And even when we come home, and there'd be a little altercation. I love this. We'd be at her house, her mom and dad's house, because... Couldn't say at my house. Anyways, at her mom and dad's house on Lumble Key, and there would something come up. She'd go, Mom, this is what he's saying. You know what she would always do? She'd always take my side. <laughs> She's gone now, but I love her for that. I thought, that what a great mother-in-law. Now, I wish I could do that now as a father-in-law. I can't quite get there, but because I always take my daughter's side, no matter what comes up. But, but, but in this... What my point is, sometimes you have to figure things out. You can't run home to mom. There's no magic fix. You just have to work it out. In the New Testament, Jesus tells parables. In Luke chapter 8, Mark 4, Matthew 13, he tells what's called the parable of the soils. And another place it's called the parable of the sower. I've taught this both ways, but listen to the parable of the soils. A farmer went out to sow his seed... And when he sowed the seed, scattered some along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell in the rocky places where it didn't have much soil, so it was rocky. The soil was about this thick, but there's a layer of rock. So it went in, but not enough. So when the heat of the day came, it just died off quickly. Some fell among thorns and thistle, and it, the weeds choked out the seed. And some, finally, the fourth was fertile soil, and it grew up and just grew and grew and grew. And that parable of soils is great because you talk about your heart and my heart. Which heart is yours? And it takes some cultivation to break that up and turn it into where it's receptive. I want the Spirit of God to live in me and I want it to grow and multiply. I don't want it to be just the birds eat it or, you know, it's just shallow or maybe something else. The worries of life choke it out. That's good teaching and I've taught it that way. But as I begin to read it recently, I begin to see it in a little different light. Another place, it's not just called the parable of soils, it's called the parable of the sower not just soils. I want you to see the difference. In this parable, it's the same parable, but the emphasis is not on the soil, but it's on the sower who sows seed. And he sows it everywhere. 
He sows it on the path. He sows it in the, in the rocky places, in the thorny places, and he sows it in the good ground. It doesn't matter. He's just into showing it and sowing it around. And some of it takes root and some doesn't. But it's the extravagance of the sower that's emphasized. There's a day in my life I began to realize that God has been throwing his love out to humanity since the beginning. And some people don't get it and they're doing the best they can. Maybe the worries of the world choke them out. Maybe they're just only about that deep. Or maybe they're just so non-responsive. But God in his extravagant loves everyone. I never had to have the soil of my heart broken up for God to have the, the word or the seed or his love flow into me. And today, my challenge to us, as we begin to realize this prescription about what we're trying to do, most of the time, it's just a change of perspective. We need to let some things go. We need to let our actions reflect God within us, but as we do so, it's in response to this love of God that's always coming to us. You know, I, I need to work at things, and so do you. We need to work out our misunderstandings, work out our kinks, our lack of obedience, work out our dysfunction. We may make some mistakes, but the acceptance of God for me called grace enables God to make a lot of mid-course corrections in my life. So here's my prayer. God, help me to understand you working in my life. Help me to listen to you before I stumble and help me to listen to you when I failed miserably, which leads number two. We need to do something about our whining and blaming when things don't go our way. At Suncoast, one of our values, the first is we're a hospital, not a courtroom. The second value is helping people take responsibility for their lives. See, when we blame people, and I grew up as a sense of blaming. I have a sister a year older and a year younger. And I want you to know it was never my fault. They were always responsible for something. And if it didn't work there, I had two younger brothers and I'd blame them. You know what I really found it difficult to blame was my older sisters or brothers because I was scared of them. Always blame the weaker. When I got married, I thought, wonderful, I finally have someone to blame for all the things, all the problems in my life. I was a terrible driver when I was in high school. Still am. The difference is I see the world a little differently now. Back then, it was always, I need to be in front, I need to be ahead, and I had a muscle car with wide tires, and I like to hear this squealing sound. And I lived in St. Petersburg. When I was 20 years old, I had 20 tickets. 20. So are you kidding me? Yeah, I'm not kidding you. I got pulled over for doing 31 in a 30. Why? Because I just looked evil. Say, so what'd you look like? I don't want to show you. My hair wasn't this short. It was kind of long and strangly and, you know, scruffy facial hair. And I just was blind to a lot of police officers. That's a different story. That's off the sermon. That's just confession. <laughs> so forgive me. I've, I've sinned. But we need to do something about our whining and blaming. And I'd always blame other people. And I, and I was typing this up. I made a typo. And I, I looked down and I started chuckling. I said, you know, we need to be continue growing in Christ. And I actually put an N in there. I said, we continue to groan in Christ. <laughs> I mean, do everything without complaining or arguing. And instead, we want to groan about it. Everything? I'm do everything without complaining or arguing. Everything? That's what it says. So who can I blame when I screw up, when I mess up? Who can I blame for every one of those 20 tickets? Becky. <laughs> we were just barely married. I still was getting tickets. I mean, who can I blame for my circumstances? If I really want to see my life get better and grow, this is the one I blame. I take responsibility. I was careless. I was foolish. And being, I know I'm not supposed to say this word, but I was stupid. I talk to people all the time who have addictive behavior. Crack, cocaine, heroin. All st I said, I probably fall into the category of addictive behavior. But you know what I'm addicted to? Stupid. I go for months without a habit, and then I just got to have it. He say, what do you mean? I just do stupid things. And I go, why did I say that to my wife? I should know better. Why did I do that? Just keeps coming back. What about you? What's yours? I look at Paul is writing, he says, quit blaming so that we can become. Become what? 
blameless, pure, children of God in a crooked and depraved generation. I mean, blameless does not mean without blame. It just means keep yourself above criticism. Not perfection, just try to do the best you can. Pure, what does that mean? It's a word used of wine, meaning undiluted wine or metal that's not been uh, weakened in any way. Pure means wholesome in character, single-mindedness. Believers are described as children of God. We're called to do something about our reaction to poor circumstances, not groaning because of circumstances, but growing despite circumstances. Years ago at Suncoast, now like I said, this summer will be 25 years, but 10 or more years ago, uh, I had a leader in charge who was a good guy, a lot of responsibilities. I really offloaded maybe too much on him. Probably it's my fault, but, but I became painfully aware that he couldn't make up his mind about what to do. I'm overly decisive. He was not decisive enough. So typically, he became a bottleneck and he couldn't make decisions. Uh, let me tell you tomorrow. And they wouldn't let the staff access to different databases and things they needed. And it was frustrating to the staff. And I was at a conference and I heard one of the speakers use these three phrases. And I was sitting there thinking, man, what am I going to do? You know, this is frustrating to my staff. And I got one guy I really love him. And how do I, how do I manage this? And there's three things that came to my mind. Well, it came from the front into my mind. First statement was this, quit whining. Fair enough. You can write this down, quit whining. Second thing, you're a smart guy or you're a smart gal. And third thing, fix it. Right? What it really is, quit whining, quit blaming all the other circumstances, figure it out and see what you can do to remedy it. Despite the fact that some things are not easily fixed, whining is not usually productive. Quit whining. Notice how I say it. Quit whining. It's like a parent slapping their kid saying, do not hit. Stop that. Figure it out. Change. And you say, I can't change my circumstance. You can't. But you can change your attitude toward it. That is within your control. That's something you can work with. So change either the circumstance or my attitude, which leads to the last thought, and it's this. We need to do something about our reflection. In verse 15, it says something like this. Lord, help me to become what you created me to be, and that's this shining star, this reflection of your light. I love to talk about stars because stars contain their light. I love the little nursery rhyme, a little song, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. I look at that and say, oh, if I could just look out into my community and say, twinkle, twinkle, little star, let the light within you twinkle to those around you because they need to see it. I mean, God put the light within us to shine to the world. We need to be examples of God's grace and his acceptance. We are to be open to God within. We are to love others as we love ourselves, to live as a bright light. We're to live as a response to grace. This is May, a couple months ago, and NCAA basketball called March Madness. We've all heard of March Madness. It's the playoff. They get in there, play basketball. And I, I had this image of the, toward the end of one of the games, some guy's been fouled. The score is like one, one down. And this 19-year-old kid is on the line. He's at the free throw line. He's got to shoot the free throw. And he's 19. He's sweating. His knees are shaking because this is the most important play. The, the national media is on him. And he looks up at the basket. Will he make the basket or not? The next scene, he's on the shoulders of his teammates, smiling as big as he can because he made the basket. And he's cutting down the net from the rim because he's the winner. The question I have for you is, which is the best picture that describes your life? See, is it based on my performance or is it based on my execution? There's sometimes one winner and many losers. But when I don't realize my connection, it's then about my performance, which leads to stress and it affects my behavior. So what can I do? What can we do? I would say we need to be proactive and do something positive. Here's what I want to share. I went to college for four years. Some of you know that. I went to graduate school for four years. Then I went to Florida State for a PhD for seven years. I could translate Hebrew, Greek, German, and speak some Spanish. What does that mean? Here's why I can sum up 27 years of education and 41 years of pastoral experience. I can sum it up for you in two words. Ready? You want all that in two words? You got to be kidding me. 
Nobody could sum it up. Yes, I can. Here's the words. Be kind. Be kind. It's not complicated. Oh, pastor, you mean I don't have to go to school anymore? I don't have to pastor anymore? Trust me, I wish I'd learned this early on. This week, I began to look at opportunities for me not to be kind. See if you can relate. When traffic is stacked up on I-75, when people are weaving in and out of traffic trying to get one car ahead when there's no possibility, or when the light turns green and you're sitting there texting, I'm behind you and the light's green. Or when my meal last week came to the restaurant 10 minutes after everyone else in the party of eight has served, my meal comes 10 minutes late. When there's a ding in my car, someone opened their car door into me. Or when the noise was so loud with somebody driving their car, louder than what I wanted. I say, Pastor, it's all about you. No, then I'll put Becky in here. When Becky would say, when your husband is not listening again, or when your car won't start, or you can't find an empty gas pump, or when all of a sudden there's no forecast for rain, so my umbrella's in the back, and I'm pulling up to the doctor's office, and it's pouring down rain, and I have to go get wet. Or when the nurse, I go in there in the nurse's office, they hand me six pages of information to fill out, and I was just there two months ago. Fill it out again, fill it out again. So what do you do when all that stacks up? I tell you, just take it out on somebody or be kind. Those around us or those around you do not know how fragile, tired, how much pain you're in or how hungry you are. They don't know how your fuse today is only that long. And despite all the frustrating people around us, let me share with you what is my suggestion. Be kind. Wouldn't it be wonderful today if we created a pandemic of be kind? People would be kinder, more patient, more loving. Say, Pastor, it seems like you talk about that a lot. Yes, I do. Because I want to be kind in everything I do. So in your hand, there's this prescription for the week. And if you can't find it, look on the screen. You can see it. And I want you to read it with me. I'll read it the first time. Be kind, they're blind. It's because all the things around us, people don't know what they're doing. So say it with me on three, would you? One, two, three. Be kind, they're blind. Let me, you, you couldn't re remember that, right? Let's try it again. Be kind, they're blind. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the times that you love us. Thank you for the times when we love others despite the fact that they're not performing well or they're frustrating us or maybe we're hungry or tired or in pain or we just have a short fuse. Thank you, God, for teaching us that it's the love of God in us that changes us. It is the love of Christ that is ours and teaches us always, always to be kind. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Would you stand, please? I'm gonna tell you a story in closing. found this story years ago and dug it back out because it fits so well. Captain Smith was the pilot of, a, of an airline flying from Seattle to L.A. Because of an airport issue in L.A., they had to land in Sacramento, and, uh, uh, which is along the way. The flight attendant came up to everybody once they landed and said, look, we're going to be here for a while, and you have about a half hour to where you can get off the plane, stretch your legs before we continue the trip down to L.A. Just be ready to come back. You're in a contained area. Come back in about 30 minutes. And everybody got off the plane except one gentleman. He was blind. He was sitting in his seat, and Captain Smith, as he walked by him, he could tell that he'd flown much because his, his seeing eye dog was just so quiet and so, so uh, passive on the plane. And he also noticed this person must like this flight a lot because the flight attendant knew his name. He said, hey, Keith, we're going to be here for a few minutes. We'll be taking off in a few minutes. And he walked back to Keith, and he said, hey, Keith, I'm the captain. He said, uh, Maybe you want to step off the plane just for a few minutes and just stretch your legs. He said, no, Captain, I don't need that. He said, but I tell you, my dog might need it. So would you give my dog a, you know, just let him stretch his legs. I'd appreciate it. He said, no problem. I'm glad to help. Now picture this. All the people are in the gate area and everything's come to a complete standstill. They look up and they see the pilot with his sunglasses on walking a seeing eye dog down the ramp. <laughs> it said that some of them changed their flight. 
back the prescription. If I were to create a t-shirt today and I'm thinking about it, it would be this, be kind, they're blind. Wouldn't that be good? Be nice to wear that because we don't know what you're going through, but I need to be kind to you because you don't realize that you're hampering me or annoying me. Be kind, they're blind. And you know what I put on the back of the shirt? Be kind, I'm blind. I'm so grateful that God loves me. He looks down and he says, man, you don't get it. You're blind and I love you anyway. And he keeps pouring his love on me every day of my life. Today, I'm here to remind you, he loves you and so do I. God bless. Thanks for coming today.